Hi, welcome back to Conversations. I'm Bill Crystal. Very pleased to be joined again for the second time in, in the last year uh, by Royal Hansen, uh, one of the most senior executives at Google. We discussed uh, privacy, safety, and security, which you're in charge of, I think, worldwide uh, for Google. Uh, in December of 2022, a conversation I recommend uh, that people look at and maybe be mostly reassured, I think, that they're not everyone is, you know, their, their Gmail is safe, so to speak, and a million other things, obviously, as well. But um, Royal has long experience in this whole area, though, of, of artificial well, artificial intelligence and its precursors and what it means. And and you, ever since you got your degree in computer science at Yale, I guess, uh, a little while ago. Yeah, um, I was thinking of David Galertner and artificial intelligence in the early 90s, our old... Uh, and you studied with him, right? I, yeah. I studied with David, yeah, exactly. That's amazing. That's interesting, yeah. yeah. So go back and look at that conversation from December. And also, I discussed this with Jim Manzi, who works in this area, almost exactly five years ago. And I just uh, skimmed the transcript of that last night. And I got to say, it stands up well and raises questions. But also, it's striking how things have changed since 2018. And Jim is a pretty forward-looking guy. It was certainly not minimizing what was going to happen. But I think even he might be surprised by what's happened. So, so ChatGPT has been in the news, artificial intelligence. Everyone's aware of these. Uh, I think that there have been breakthroughs or changes, but t t what, where are we? What's what's happening here? Is, how new is it? How surprising is it? How fast is it moving, et cetera? It's great. And I I read that uh, the transcript again, too, and I thought it was really insightful and helpful to have a marker at that 2018 or so point, because it is a paper from Google in 2017 and the DeepMind team that sort of um, sets us on the path we're on now. And I think Jim captured that nicely. But even he, I, I suspect, couldn't quite have imagined where this was all going. And I think, you know, there's always this balance between the hype of what's going on and what's really happening. And I think it's a it's a nice conversation and a good starting point. But if you so using that as sort of the marker, let's go backwards in time a bit. The, the invention of deep learning or some of these, which is sort of an extension of machine learning, which is all a subset of artificial intelligence, just to give you another date, sort of born in about 2011. So if it gives you a sense of, and then before, if you go way back, 90s, 80s, I mean, the, the concept of artificial intelligence goes way back. But some of these concepts were being worked on for decades. So, that, so a lot of what you're seeing is not net new, but there are significant advancements that change the shape of the curve. So if you think back to 2011, People invent this idea of deep learning, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And they, the, the advances in, in computational power. And so let me just start with that, because I think you know, Jim talks in the, in the conversation about Moore's Law and just how, how much more computer power in simple terms is available. And the, in addition to just computer power, you know, Moore's Law doubling every 18 months, and you could argue whether that continues now, and I don't think it does it quite the same way, but um, they people began to realize with deep learning that the real need was not for, if you think about a typical computer program, do this, do that, do this, do that. It's a linear sequence of instructions, you know, typing, hitting return, you know, saving, sending. Deep learning starts to say, I want to do a thousand, a million, uh, 10 million calculations at the same time. And the historical computers, you know, your Intel, you know, kind of the, the, the are in our PCs and in our servers, weren't architected to do that quickly. What was architected to do that quickly, and people thought, oh, wow, maybe we could use these together, is gaming PCs. Mm -hmm. And so you'll hear this GPU. Think about on your, your um, screen when you play a video game you know, in the old days, you could watch the pixels be drawn in, and you knew you were on a slower, something was slowing down because the pixels had to redraw again and again and again from the top. So this concept of a GPU and NVIDIA, which people see news about as a, as a company in, in GPU, and Google has a form of this called the TPU, said, we can generate all the pixels on a screen at the same time again and again and again. And it's just much faster for playing video games, for looking at video. And so you can see the benefits. YouTube, we're much better with video uh, than we ever were. That's because of hardware advancements. Someone said, 
that's the same thing we need for deep learning. So you think about that, like that progression is the first thing that begins to change the shape of the curve. Just far more computational power available to this. Now, when I say these things all have to be calculated at once, and Jim talks about this, that like think about a word, you've got a long, a, a lot of text and it's all represented, you know, as a, a number. He, he talks about this in the, and you want to predict the next number. So you're, you're, you're basically asking of all the words in the world, which is the next word. You want to run that calculation and the probability at the exact same time. That's something that the, the GPU and TPU does really well. So there's an intersection between video and gaming and deep learning that starts the, the curve. The second thing that happens is there's a lot of what I'd call clever mathematics. And this is, I think, you, you know, we alluded to a little bit of it, but um, in a neural network, which is you know, just a, a long, long list of inputs. Think about the body or the mind. And we're getting all this signal and then two neurons come together and a signal comes out the other side and it goes to the next layer. So you've got a long list of um, inputs and you've got a deep matrix. Like, you know, it goes from one layer to the next layer to the next layer to the next layer. Even if you have very, very powerful computers, as as you're calculating each layer of that, like is it one or zero, one or zero, one or zero, and it goes eight, nine, ten deep. What what happened in 2017 is they, they realized that the thing you learn from like the seventh or the eighth or the ninth or the tenth layer in was actually relevant to the first layer. And so if you really want a precise answer, you got to go back and recalculate. That's just super, super expensive when you're talking about tens and hundreds of millions of you know, inputs. And so there's some very clever math, and I, I mean, we don't need to sort of bottom it out, which starts to say you don't have to go back. And they find ways of compressing all of those calculations to be faster. And I think you know, for this audience, there's, there is, it's not just the, the strength of the computer. It's also some very clever math going on to speed up those calculations. So if you think of those two things going on, so give us that's a, the, an example, those are the forces maybe. that lead us here. So 2011, 2017, two big breakthroughs. But what, what, hap what can be done after 2011? That, what do we see as consumers, as it were, or as users after 2011 that we couldn't have seen before 2011? Uh, and what do we see after 2017, I guess? I mean, Google Translate's talked about a, a fair amount, for example. But That's a good example. So as you get to the point where, and let's talk about that 2011, 2017, um, you, you start to be able to say, I don't just want to know what's the most likely next word. I want to look at this paragraph and what the relationships are between the words. And I can improve the prediction of the next word. So I think we all noticed in translation and in autocomplete, you think about sort of the autocomplete in, in, in Gmail, right. um, the quality going dramatically up over that period. And that really is a function of this clever math of figuring out, you know, the, the, the man jumped over his fence. Well, the man and his have a relationship. The old versions didn't take that into account. And so you're, you, you know, whereas now these new, the sort of clever math says, ah, oh, his and the man are related. And let's weight the, the prediction more heavily based on that knowledge. And that just extends to translation. It tr extends to, and this is really beginning to get to what large language models are. So, so if you type in the woman, I'm just being simple, extremely simple minded here. This will now tell you that her is the pronoun, or if, that's if that the, were the her, yeah, it would give you, or if that were the you know sentence that was part of the larger context, right? You would you would attach those uh, yeah. in in the in the the weighting or the mental or like, let's call it the mathematical model behind the scenes. And this is a so this is a breakthrough in the 2011 range. 
the 2017 is where that that what's called the transformer people will hear that is what happens there but it's only made possible by the this deep learning idea i see the other thing that i think you just to talk about with deep learning is with that computational power and the clever math we used to spend a lot of time as a community labeling the data so is this picture of a cat of a toaster is this word, you know, is this word French or, you know, you can think about all the ways in which you categorize or label data. What deep learning really did was um, you could, and this is what you start to see now with the, the, the large language models, you're feeding literally exabytes of data into um, the model without labeling it. And the, it's what I talked about before, like, you know, the, it's lit, it's labeling the data, if that makes sense. The computer is labeling the words, not a bunch of humans who are going through and tagging it. And that is made possible by these sort of that clever math and the usage of graphical computers, this sort of um, faster computers. And all of it. So, and then that it combined with what I just described, which is, is there a relationship between his and the man, the ball and it, you know, a cake and food eating and you know you can think about all the relationships that uh, we were saying before the it's like the sat the, the, all of a sudden this thing can answer the analogy questions on an sat hmm. combine that with massive amounts of data and you see the kind of progression we talk about and and i think so bard chat gpt they're really a product of those those forces that's 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 so interesting so just to go and just to Go, I want to get to ChatGPT and all part and all that, which is the current thing in a second. But um, I, I was so struck by the Google Translate example, which sort of became famous in that New York Times article in, I don't know, 2016, 17-ish, I guess, and and that Jim talks about it in the conversation we had. So clearly, I mean, that this the move from word-for-word word translate, inputting dictionaries, basically, and having instantaneous uh, dictionary function in Google Translate, which was useful if you wanted to read an article. You, someone, you could at least make your way through it if you didn't know the language. It was clunky though because each word just got translated. It wasn't really a sentence, so to speak, or a, you know, it wasn't always uh, very uh, elegant. And then, as I understand it, instead of having dictionaries in there, if I can put it in this way, you have zillions and zillions of translations. Uh, you know, of everything from Wikipedia to Tolstoy novels to everything else. And the machine is 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 using those more like a human would. When, you, when a human translates something from French to English, you don't do it word by word. You read a sentence and you understand the sentence and you reproduce that in English, right? I mean, it's, some, some, it's a different, it seems like a different mental function somehow. And it seems like just as a user of Google Translate that there was an important moment where Google Translate moved from that first word for word, let's call it clunky, you know, just just computing power dictionary to genuinely be sounding a lot more, seeming a lot more like a human translator. It's exactly that. It's this, and you'll hear people call it transformer, but it's this ability to include more than just that mapping, the one-to-one -one mapping you described. So not only, you know, you know, his and, and the man or, you know, the queen and the woman are, are one example. But the depth of those relationships, to your point, a paragraph of French, there's a lot of relationships in that paragraph, much of which we couldn't even probably articulate or even entirely agree upon as humans. Right. But if you give these models the entire corpus of French literature, begins to figure those out and weight them. This is the point about, like, it's not magic. It's just that you've got so many combinations possible. And if you run them enough times, it starts to say, no, that's, that's the right word for this. That's the right sentence. That's the right phrase. And I, and that's the, the, and Jim is you know right on the cusp of that. And that's what you just see accelerating um, after 2017. I think in 2018, Jim said pretty soon we may be able to have you go to a foreign country and uh, speak into your iPhone uh, or any device and and have it speak out to the locals in their language, uh, either show them their language on the screen, but actually just also vocalize it. And I remember at the time thinking, oh, that's amazing. I was in Prague 
you know, two months ago, and I didn't myself use it, and I didn't have to really, but people were just using it routinely, and quite impressively, right? So that's that's amazing. Diff- that, yeah, so that is cool. different. Well, think the pixel. And if you've people seen the pixel ads, if you were watching, you know, the NBA finals or something, you saw these pixel ads, and they have that great ad on the sort of blacktop with this guy, you know, being intimidated by uh, some, you know, he's not doesn't speak English. But he shows up and says, you know, you know, what is it, my turn or something, you know, my, you know, and he does, he uses it in real time on the blacktop. Mm-hmm. So it's um, that's definitely true. I, I just one other example of that that people may not realize if you if you haven't used lens on um, in the Google Photos, you're now able to search the web by you, know, you take the picture, so to speak, and you say search for that on the web. It's the same thing. You're looking, you know, you, you're it's using exactly the same technology to pattern match an image that you take a picture of in real time and then go look out into the into the model to find the object that's similar. And so that's different really from where we were pre-2011 or even pre-2017. Oh yeah, even I mean, before 2017, yeah, exactly. It's not exactly. just more more powerful version of the same. No, it's, it's that um, the, the hardware advancements start in 2011, 2012. And then there's this additional clever math, this transformer, that adds all that contextual data that's enabled all kinds of things. I mean, you know, that's the Gmail auto complete. We even use it in our data centers to optimize the cooling for, for power consumption. So these are things that have just snuck their way into all kinds of processes behind the scenes. Amazing. So, okay, so now we're in 2023, like it's the end of 2022, and ChatGPT shows up, maybe slightly, uh, I mean, not really out of nowhere for you people, of course, but in the kind of public uh, imagination, slightly out of nowhere. And it's writing essays and what's going on, and it's challenging, it's answering questions or not answering questions correctly, and has a point of view, it seems. And so, what's that all about? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I was looking at, and if, if people look at Demis Hassabis as sort of the CEO of the Google Deep Mind, which is where the, if people, you know, a lot of these papers come from and um, the Alpha Fold or Alpha Go, people know the game playing that they've, where they've beaten the world champions. You know, his point was a good one, which is that these capabilities began to exist post 2017, 18, 19, as we developed them internally. I think there was always a question like, what's the, what are all the right form factors? And, And his point was that the, chatbot interface, it you know surprised everybody a bit how quickly people would want to play around with and engage with that interface rather than these being baked into Gmail or baked into the photos or baked into you know uh, a medical uh, device or alpha fold, which is where they did the protein. Um, you know they sort of in, in a, over a couple of weeks uh, figured out all the protein folding possibilities. Which would have taken you know you know millions of years to do. Using it as a chatbot, I think people wondered what would be the what exactly is the utility. I think we're still figuring that out, to be honest. Like there's still a lot of questions about exactly whether that's the right form factor for everything we want to do. But that cha- that did change the public perception of what was going on. But those things those models existed for the last several years. And when people say, "Well, that's generative AI," generative artificial intelligence as opposed, I suppose, to simple artificial intelligence. Uh, what do they mean by that? And also relatedly, I guess, large language models. Those seem to be the two, for my limited reading, the two key, two of the key Words. phrases were, yeah, terms that do seem to capture something, I gather, somewhat new and, and different. Yeah, that's right. Um, and and I think the the language is being, you know, even in, this, in the specialists, among specialists, uh, I, I see language being sort of figured out in the vocabulary for this. So nobody should feel badly if it still sort of feels a little bit um, confusing. The, um, let's see, the we said large language models. Generative and, uh, AI. Uh, generative AI. LLF, yeah. I think of generative AI in, in just simple terms as you're predicting the next word, the next sentence, that you're, you're generating a photo. It's, you know, behind the scenes, you can, lots of computer programs generate the next step. This is just generating it in the sort of native interface of complete my sentence or do do something, anticipate or predict, generate an image, generate a song, generate a word, generate a summary. 
it's not overly complicated in that sense, but a lot of, back to my earlier point about the ways in which these models have been used, you wouldn't think of them as having a human interface always, where a human's asking you to generate the next thing. But that is what a lot of computers do behind the scenes. Like if this, you think of it even in the, um, the data center example I give, if you're making calculations about how much water to send where to cool the computers, if the temperature's this, it's generating a number. But it's not generative in the way that we're talking about a chat bot or a, or a movie maker. And that's the generative side. It's predicting the next answer. And it's generative in a public facing way, you might say, as opposed to I the, think inter that's why the innards talking. of the computer, you know, regulating a nuclear power plant. Of course, it has to think ahead I and mean, think ahead or however you want to say. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And so the generative now is just more obvious to the end user because they're the one making the uh, the ask and seeing the immediate result rather than somewhere deep in the computer. That's correct. Now, I remember when autocorrect you know, began and, and uh, I mean, it's always been sort of an object of fun and almost ridicule at times because it's annoying and it miscorrects based on whatever. But it, I remember thinking at the time, well, this is a little different from before that one could have spell it. You, you could have, uh, and then auto predict and when, when they give you the three choices of the next word or whatever. And and then they, I gather, use your own past choices to improve the prediction, the, the choices they're giving you. So you're not getting the same choices as the guy down the block who uses different formulations and phrases. But that's all a little different from spelling correct, let's say, which is just a just, but which is a little more like the old dictionary, right? That it's programmed. There's only understand. one answer or two answers, right? Right. It corrects the spelling idea. of your name or my name if it's used enough to to, uh, to suggest a correction. But predicting is different. I, it does feel different to me. And of course, the auto prediction, as it were, is uh, not the most interesting use, obviously. <laughs> but I mean, but it. It's an interesting point. Like the grammar correct, you know, now you see the grammar and, the, you know, better, more and more nuance to the grammar correction. Right. That's really just to your point, the generative work, because it's saying, no, I would have generated a different sequence. So let's, right. do you want to change it? Yeah. It's when it the says, same capability behind the scenes. Yeah. When it says you might not want to, this word is un, maybe unnecessary. Exactly. That's a little different from telling you you just misspelled something with two T's instead of. Absolutely. One T. Absolutely. And that's back to this point of having the context of the whole sentence, the whole paragraph. And look, you're gonna even end up in worlds where your own your own style is introduced. That's what's gonna be powerful here. And we'll talk about that maybe next with the large language models, okay. is that you know, you, you're still getting a kind of general um, uh, prediction, how one should write this, or what's the most likely um, next sentence in the world, not for Royal or Bill. But let's talk about that for a second. So, so if your large language model question, again, the simple version of large language model is if you go back, like my work with David Lerner in, in, the, in the early 90s, we we're dealing with parameter lists of like a few dozen. That's the sort of order of the amount of complexity. In 2011, you know, sort of that word to VEC example, which Jim talked about in a or, or other examples, you know, you're starting to get into the millions of parameters and complexity. In 2017 and 2018, you're starting to get to tens of millions, hundreds of millions. But now you've seen these numbers that people talk about in 2022 and three for these large, what I would call large language models. Now we're in the hundreds of billions of parameters. And don't, you know, that's really just a representation of what I talked about before, the size of this neural network and the depth. You get a multiplier that gives you those big numbers. But the point is, that's not just going from 1 to 10 to, to 20 or to 30 or 1 to 100. You're talking about from 2011 or from early, you know, early 90s, you're going from you know, a million in, in the 2011 to 100 billion and sort of bordering on trillion. Humans don't think about how big a leap that is. And that's large language model, like the, the, the amount of context that's captured now is of that order different from what we were doing in 2011 or 2012. So but it's not a different class of thing. And, and it happens to be done for language. But the truth is now we're, we're well outside of language. We're using, using uh, I don't know if you tried the music. If you haven't tried the Google music, you can ask it to compose a song in the style of Thelonious Monk and Beethoven with this basis. And it will play a brand new song made up. So it's not large language models. That concept is, yes, we learned about it through chatbots, but it exists in any mode 
you hear you hear multimodal. That just means text, video, music, whatever. So that's interesting. So on the music side, since I, I kind of like music, yeah, I haven't done this though. I haven't tried this. You so should play around. Days, yeah. In the old days, it yes, it could play Beethoven. In the old days, maybe it could it could play you five versions of the same Beethoven. Obviously, you can play those and maybe even think about those or or do something in the style, I suppose, of one or the other. But but now it's actually can compose a new Beethoven concerto that's based on its understanding understanding of, of all the Beethoven concertos and all other, a lot of huge numbers of other concerti from the same time, I suppose, and successors and th those that were influenced by Beethoven, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, is that the right way to think That's about right. it? That's right. Yeah. And maybe just to kind of get started on a, a theme that I think we we'll want to talk a little bit about is that in the same way, I remember being in college and my music major friends who, as they would get to their final exams as, you know, you know, conductors you know, and, and the, or, or composers, and the exams would be things like just what we said, give me a new, you know, take the Beethoven sonata number 30 and translate it or sort of transform it to a Mozart style, you know, whatever. They'd give them this. It's like the SAT again, right? Like the relationship. And they'd have to do it. And, you know, between teacher and student, they would know whether they were more or less right. That's what's going on. But it's mm -hmm. not because we've we've. Um, told it all the rules for that we've just fed it the corpus of music and it's found those relationships just like we talked about with words in a way that seems awfully similar to the way someone who has grown up in composing music has that intuition so there's an element of what i would almost call intuition or emergent why, why people call, talk about it as emergent properties it's the same thing with the human humans begin to sort of emergent like oh i see the relationship or I'm able to do something quite clever because I see these things and other people didn't see it. And so I think of that as that expert, like things that experts can do with a lot of effort, and a lot of training, these large language models, multimodal in this case, are starting to demonstrate those same kinds of capabilities. Now they're not doing it because they have all the rules or because they have um, you know, even all the weights in the decisions that they make. But somehow with that quantity of data and that clever math that kind of re recurses on what they learn, goes back and injects what we learn into the model again, it's finding these, finding these relationships. Um, and I think that's the power of it going forward. Any expert who knows how to do something, but it takes them a long time to kind of cobble together the steps, now can use these tools to more quickly get those things done whether you're a scientist folding proteins or whether you're scheduling PTA meetings. Yeah, that's so interesting. So, so remember when I talked with Gary Kasparov, who's also written, of course, a lot about this, uh, maybe that was, five, I don't know, six, seven years ago, we had that conversation and he'd written, I think, a book about a, a book about this. And he was struck, so he lost to Deep Blue in 1996 or seven, I think. And as, as I understand it, Deep Blue at the time had been programmed with all the grandmaster games, basically, in chess and had therefore knew what the right move was a little more reliably than even Gary, the greatest chess player of his time and maybe ever. But what he was struck by, and I think this happened fairly recently when we spoke, was that you, the computers now didn't need to study the games. You just fed in all the rules of chess. This is back and, to that deep learning, right? Yeah. It doesn't, you don't need to label all the games. Right, you don't here's need to say this game, is here's this a bad game. game. Right, and this work move led to this victory and, or defeat. You just plugged in the rules of chess, Go is more complicated because it's a more open-ended sort of game, as I as I gather. But um, and it was able to figure out the best way to play chess because it just had all the rules. But what you're saying is we're now a step. If I'm correct, and feel free to correct me, um, we're a step beyond that because we're not really feeding in rules that the computer is figuring out. You know, given the all the rules, given the rules of chess, you know, white pawn to king four is is the best opening move, and the following is the best response to the next move, and so forth. It's that it's it's more, yeah, as you say, about emergent relationships somehow. I mean, somehow, yeah, explain to me, I guess, maybe, maybe try to do a little more. Yeah, what, it, am, I right that, context, am I right that that's sort of, we're beyond that now, in a sense. We're beyond simply maximizing the efficiency, as it were, of a certain set of, of playing definitely. within a certain set of rules. And we're, so I think there's a, there's another concept, which let me try and introduce, to, hopefully this doesn't confuse it, but it, this, there is the next level, which you're starting to get at. You are correct that like 
not having to label every picture of a cat in a toaster in the AlphaGo and Alpha, um, you know, the, the chess versions and the protein, like, you do have to feed the, like, what is a move? Like, it has to know what are legal moves. Right. But then to, to your point, it doesn't, in that case, you can generate every possible move and then let the computer through that sort of, think of it almost like that relationship between his and the man. There are, think of that as better and worse moves. Just, and there's bazillions, literally, of those little adjustments that can be made. What it does is it plays the game, literally, and, and like I said, from instead of 1 million times, 100 billion times, just to give you the order of you know, magnitude, and that's what's happening. It doesn't, you know, the rules are almost, they're, they're not helpful because it can, it'll figure out whether that's a better move or not by trying all these combinations and tweaking the, you know, whether there's a better or worse move. Now, what I just highlighted in there, though, something that is a little different, large language models or, you know, image models or, or music models are, they call these foundational models. So, and they take literally weeks and months to train, to go through all that data, even with all the powerful stuff I just talked about. And then you get a, they call it a mo- you know, the model. And with these, all these little weights that tell, you know, so if you get this word, you get this length, uh, you get this music, whatever, that's the input and it gives you back output. They're trained in a very general sense, but to our conversation right here, if what I want to do is win a game of chess and chess could be played with words, right? You, you tell the, you're just telling um, the, the game what to do, but in English you could, you know, King F4, right? Yeah. Um, but you could, the same thing could be done for um, modeling the uh, molecular possi- you know, molecular possibilities or for scheduling, like I said, scheduling meetings. It's just, instructions that are given out or a sort of it's a, there's a language for doing it and the truth is these large language models don't get everything right you hear this word hallucination right they're they're just given their best guess given what we talked about so if you then take a small set of experts and say here was the answer that the large language model gave to this question like um what's the fastest route to, you know, what's the fastest, you know, the, the directions are used the same kind of uh, work, that kind of you know, traffic directions. And they give an answer, they give five answers. You have experts say, that's the best one, that's the next best, whatever. And you do a small amount of that. You know, you have 10 experts give a look at 100, ans- 100 questions and rate them. You, you do what's called fine tuning. The other word people will hear is uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback. So the large language model, you don't go back and train it from the very beginning, but you get a small number of experts to rate the answers and or give the best answer. You feed that back into the weights of the model. And all of a sudden, it's not just a little better at playing chess. We're not just a little better at scheduling meetings or anticipating the next word. It, it, it almost seems, again, exponentially better. Yeah, that's... Because deep in the model is this relationship, and I'll, and it says, "Oh, I get it. I know exactly what these experts are saying." And then it can extrapolate, and that I think is where you're starting to see even more power. Is that the specialized models? It's great to have ChatGPT or Bard or these big models. What's really great is to have a radiologist, um, a, a version of the model tuned for someone reading X-rays, or for someone navigating travel in a foreign country, or for you know, you, you think of anything and each one of those can be tuned with the additional input of a small number of experts. And it doesn't take weeks and months. It takes seconds to improve those models. Yeah, that's good. I'm going to put chess. As, I think I sort of misled myself a little on the chess thing. I've been thinking about this over the past few years because chess is such a, is of course, such a constrained, constrained, exactly. finite exactly. number of, of moves, which is not the that's case right. with radiology and music, presumably. And, well, that's right. Uh, so, but you're saying that, so let's just take, I'm going to come now to, in a few minutes to the specific fields that have been most affected, which medicine is obviously one possibly, but also traffic and a million other things, scheduling. and. But um, 
So what you're saying, am I correct? So on the music side, maybe that's an easier one for people to understand. So we've got this computer generating for one's instructions. Uh, we've got this machine learning generating, um, you know, a Mozart-like piano concerto in a minor key, which is what, and maybe characters with certain other characteristics of Mozart at a certain period of his composing career or whatever like that. But you're, do the human experts then still have to step in and say, so that's a good yeah. example. So let's say, so it will do that now, right, for music, and it will yes. give you the answers. But if you take Leonard Bernstein and a few, you know, a few few students, whatever, and you give them ten or a hundred versions of that, and they say, you know what, like because it's not going to give you one answer. It can no, only give you it, ten Mozart it, it give you piano 10. concertos and C minor. And you say which is the best? Which yeah. is the best? Seems the best to you? They don't even know why. They just say that's the best. Well, this is. Sounds more like Mozart. It sounds more like stuff. Mozart yeah. in that answer. And then if you do that, and then you take that information, and this is where it's almost like a model training a model, right? It's like, a, if that makes sense, you then run it back against the large language model. And all of a sudden, its ability to answer that category, you know, you can think about category can be large or small, depending on how you train it, gets dramatically better. Hmm. So I do. So you're seeing that. I mean, that's why the hallucinations or the mistakes. Like, there's still a fair number of mistakes. Like you, you, this is the you know you saw the New York Times piece from the very beginning with ChatGPT. Like some some bizarre stuff comes out. Right. But that stuff can be quickly improved with this sort of um, human expert input. And again, you don't need to do it for a hundred years of text. You just need to do it with a small number of people. And I think that's one of the things that surprised people that the the speed at which whatever deep patterns exist in the music or in the language or in the image can be tuned, the, the speed at which that can happen is surprising. It's really quite remarkable. Yeah, I want to get to the sort of, yeah, the speed, that's such an interesting question, whether you, you've been surprised by the, and one should be surprised by the speed with which things have accelerated as opposed to slowing down in a way that people kept expecting. With Moore's law, I guess it's different from Moore's law, but but just on the human thing. So, but for now, at least, you still need the human expert to come in and say, human the expert is super valuable in that in that what would they call uh, reinforcement learning or fine tuning. If if what I talked about in the beginning is pre training, like you do the pre training of these large models, there's still a real role in all of these fields for the experts. So, let's take my security team. We you know, we, we see literally billions of these events every day on the giant Google network. Our team uses this very model to help them prioritize, but they have to first help tune the response by saying, you know, that's actually a better answer on, on balance. And so we go through the exercise of tuning our, our usage of it with experts. And that's going to happen. Like, I think there's a really democratizing element to this is that everybody, everybody knows something as an expert. And that I think is what's also is quite exciting about the whole thing and why the chatbot in a way was, was exciting. And it put that, the feeling of that power in the hands of a lot of people. And I think that's where the, the future is not going to be chatbots. It's going to be experts tuning these large language models for, you know, efficiency that everyone would benefit from, but that nobody has access to the, the expert in, I don't know what it is, um, farming, like there would be the elements of niche farming that, you know, the internet has helped connect people, but now you'll be able to get the, the expertise of that niche farmer in a model somehow. And the, some of that expertise is expertise, the boats are specialists, you know, uh, uh, great composer, great conductors or, or scholars. Of Mozart, but some of that, am I right or, or wrong? Some of it could just be, con not just be, but be consumer feedback in a certain way. That is, presumably ways works better if I, having just driven a lot the last couple of days, as a consumer of ways tells them, actually, you got this a little wrong. I don't know what's wrong with your algorithm there, but you didn't capture the fact that there was a slowdown here on I-86 or, or whatever. Is that similar? The first, and, the first and most obvious way to get that feedback is just to take the actions that people take. In in with your model, so you're right. Whether they're experts or not, but but that, but I think that's that's the democratizing. You know, if you're using the tool, and you're and you're giving it signal, that's feedback. But the humans are still 
useful or even crucial to this development? At what point does computer correct crucial. computer, so to speak? And it, yeah, it, I think they're crucial now. And you just keep moving up the order of like, you know, it, it goes from the, think how much, think how many of things you do on a rescheduling a dermatology appointment and sort of what a pain in the neck it is still. You can, we can connect those dots. I know how to. We just need to sort of train the models and connect them up in a safe way, kind of a responsible way. And then we can move on to the next thing. So I, I, I do think it's just a matter of putting to bed a lot of the things in each field or area that we know how to do, but we haven't figured out how to quickly automate. It takes a software development team and a bunch of rules. I mean, this is to your point. Most automation at the moment takes somebody writing the software. And they got to know the rules. They may not even know what they're doing. They're just writing the software. Now, the person who knows how to do it, just language becomes code. That's the other thing maybe. that's like, Instead of Java or C, English becomes code. It's really empowering. Everybody's a software developer in their own and, way. And so how fast are things moving? And I guess there are two sides of that that occur to me. One is beneath the surface, I mean, have you been struck by the rapidity of the progress and and do we know why that's happening and do we expect that to continue or even speed up further or are we at a sort of rapid spurt and then it subsides or are there inflection points? And then maybe we get to this a bit later is from the kind of uh, public facing side, how quickly does this get translated into things that people see the effects of? How, how different is radiology five or 10 years from now? The driving cars, that seemed self-driving cars, that didn't seem to happen quite as quickly as people expected. Uh, things happened faster than people expected. But maybe for just on the underlying side first, I mean, uh, how you, you've been, we, are you surprised by where we are compared to what you expected five years ago? I am. I think the last year has, well, let's say when I got to Google five years ago and a year or two in, somebody showed me that music app, but it was just internal at that point. I was blown away. I mean, I didn't, I mean, I, I was amazed what it could compose. So that, but that step, I mean, is a big step. And I think there's a lot of work now and that's the race to, to build more computers and put this in more people's hands. And there's a lot of work though, domain by domain, you know, use case by use case, if you want to think about it in that way to, to take advantage of these, these new capabilities that's going to take time because to your point, you, you need the either the users or the experts to engage and you got to put the right tools in the right people's hands and people got to learn how to do it. So there's going to be a fair amount of work in the coming years to make this applicable in all these different ways. And as you know, as I talk to people who understand maybe the hardware or the math, you know, better than I do, I do think we will continue to need clever mathematical or clever. Like we're still, the fact that we're even still talking about graphical processing units and not, you know, AI machine learning processing units is still a sign that we're on a path to figuring out what's the optimal way to use the hardware. And, and I think there will still be mathematical breakthroughs. This is what, you know, when I talk to Demis or James Manyika, or sort of, there's sort of people thinking about these, where it goes, there's still necessary innovations. But there's also a lot of progress you will see in the coming months and years as more in, you know, experts, individuals are able to put this capability to use in their own domain. And so I would put it in those two categories, right? There's a lot of work right in front of us, low-hanging fruit to make things better. And then there are still some big, like what we're talking about, these models don't have a model of the world, right? They don't, they don't, they don't go back to a, they're just predicting based on almost intuition. They're not grounding it always in, uh, 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 you know, truth as as modeled somewhere in the computer. There, the people are working on that. They don't have memory, right? They don't, you know, you kind of get what you get when you interact with it in this chatbot. But over time, you'll get a personalized version that will have some memory of your experiences and be able to build off of those things. So there's those things will continue to happen in parallel, even while people use the capabilities we have now. I mean, I think the one thing I would just highlight and the reason that's sort of important and I think the way it unfolded is bad guys are also using this stuff. So, I mean, we maybe we get onto that, but like why we, you kind of have to be, you hear Google talk about bold and responsible. Hmm. 
is every time I say, yeah, it's democratizing, you know this from your, you know, you better, far better than I do. There are downsides to, to everything available to everybody. Bad guys use this, the, the technology too. Yeah, available to and everybody so, is available to criminals and to dictators. Criminals, and so exactly. Right. And so doing the, the other thing that's got to happen is we need to make sure we don't undo the safety benefits that we've baked into the, you know, the thing we talked about last, you know, in December, all these benefits that are baked into the, um, you know, the big services at a Google or, or a, you know, the large software providers and the new things we just talked about, right? If everybody's writing code in English, because English is now the coding language, what safety um, and guardrail, safety sort of mechanisms and guardrails do we want to bake in so it's secure and safe by default? That's the kind of thing that my team in this, you know, just sort of contextualize me for a moment. That's what we're working on. Extend those secure by default up into these new use cases. So that's where I think things will happen in the coming years. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm struck listening to you, though. It sounds like you think many of these use cases, I mean, they are kind of low-hanging fruit. That is, we've only, or what, just tell me what the, to oversimplify, or we, it sounds like we're only 10, 20, 30% along the path of uh, improving medical diagnostics or, or, or improving pharmaceutical, maybe, uh, creation or even or automobile safety or all these uh, kind of things that we've, we're now somewhat familiar with from the last three, four years. But there's, it sounds like that does not require really conceptual breakthroughs at this point. It requires just continuing on the road we're on. But you think that's a pretty dramatic road, I guess, on the other hand. Pretty dramatic not, road. I think in the same way you feel, you've seen people react to the chat bots and been like, wow, I'm amazed at how well this can do this. That It's going to do that in every domain where we can add a little bit of that expert knowledge or put it in the right you know, workflow for a doctor, um, you know, for a policymaker, et cetera. And do you have an instinct about what areas might be most, uh, or moving, what well, that instinct, but you, you, you're observing it. I mean, what areas seem to be moving the fastest? What areas are turn out to be more recalcitrant, maybe if that's the right word, to, to this sort of imp uh, improvement? I think, you know, the obvious first places are where there's already a high degree of automation. Because the, the thing this can't do is it can't automate the process if it, the process has not already got some computer hooked up to it and can... So, so, you know, there are some fields where that's just far more true than others. And my hope is this accelerates the digitization and improvement of some of those other areas because they realize actually we could solve some of these problems. Uh, Demis Hassabis, who you know the Deep Mind CEO, always talks about science at digital speed. So you know we all these problems that people you know a lot of scientists who can imagine testing medical or physics or other kind of you know uh, experiments, but now they could more quickly use the, these, this data to do science. So my hope is that science and the benefits to, to the real world individuals in health, in safety, is a, is, a, is, the, is a big push. But then I think the other one is just convenience. Right? Think of the, you already see people stringing together instructions using these chatbots to do some simple things. So the, the, low, the other side of this is just think of uh, people on their mobile phones, on their laptops, as they start to string together, you know, it's almost like macros on steroids, right? Or sort of the, you know, you're just, you're putting little instructions together. And I think you'll see a lot of that too. And then, but the areas What's where we're not digitizing. What's an example of that? I mean, what would that be? That's your scheduling instruction. You could think I about see. where, right, call, you know, call and reschedule my doctor's appointment for a date that I'm free in uh, December. And what that, has to string together all those things, those pieces of software, that's going to happen quickly. And your phone could call the doctor's phone and yeah, or they, interact with their online, you know, you could say I mean, you start to interact with the online system right. and then they have to do a matching exercise because it has access to your calendar right. and it suggests state so that I think there's just a lot of that efficiency that will come. That's not and you know, it's not particularly threatening in the grand scheme. I and mean, these are things that people have to do anyway at the at this point. Right. Right. And, and then guess, science. Yeah, I think science is the other area I'm really excited about. So. Uh, yeah, but at medicine, but also broader science and broader science. Yep. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And where 
has reality proved more recalcitrant than people expected, would you say? Yeah, I mean, I just, I think the only thing so far that I would say is that he, he, if it's not digitized, you can't even start. Yeah. Or if it's not language, music, I mean, it's a form of digitization. The reason we can do it with language is because language has been digitized. Music's been digitized. It images. Um, I'm trying to think about the best examples, but there are certainly industries which are older in their adoption of technology, which won't be as quick to adopt this, but maybe this will, in, it will encourage them to do so. I, mean, I guess education is a big question, right? And in, in theory, it could, ha- it could be extremely useful, but in practice, maybe there's still such a huge human component, or maybe we, that's just a, an old fashioned prejudice that we think there's a huge human component and there's a ton that could be done. It's a good question. I, you know, we, I was talking with my wife last night about, uh, about education and sort of what will the role, you know, there's this whole field of what they call prompt engineering emerging, right. which is how do you write, you know, it's a version of what I talked about, which is how do you write the right question or in, instruction to the model to get the answer you want? It's a form of that expert putting their input in. That, that's going to become a skill. Right, like using your H, your TI calculator that you, you know, when you first got that, uh, that did derivatives somehow on it, uh, on it. Though it's a version of that, right? That'll be part of school. But generally, it sounds like you think we're fairly early stages in a lot of these areas. I mean, so if we come back in five years, you expect pretty, pretty big trans- changes, but not quite transformations or actual transformations in some of these areas. I think uh, it will be every bit as big, if not bigger, than the the timeline we've just lived through, you know, the, the sort wow. of seven, eight, yeah, yeah, I think it'll be big. So the next 10 years will be as big or bigger than the pre- preceding 10 Absolutely. Years. And then it somehow still stops short of artificial general intelligence, as they call it. I mean, that really is the kind of computers running the world and the science fiction stuff and dystopian or maybe utopian stuff, depending on your point of view, more dystopian probably, but I mean, we're, we're not there, right? Yeah. I mean, we're certainly not there now. I mean, in the sense that like I said before, there's the the model, these don't have models of the world behind them. They are prediction engines in that sense. Very good ones. And then they're demonstrating, I think, what's possible. I, you know, I, I am not as, um, I think the definitions of that can be debated. Uh, but I do think you will see not just predictions, but memory um and models of the world begin to be made useful initially in narrow fields like medicine or, but you can see where those things get strung together. I have no idea, you know, what we'll be debating on the topic of a uh, artificial general intelligence, but I do think it's important to this sort of responsibility angle that as countries, companies, we think about and work through together the boundaries or the or the sort of safeguards as we go there. I'm not as worried about the end state. I'm worried about along the way, are we collaborating in healthy ways as an industry and as a country? And you you know, this I think the White House done a nice job here with and then and we'll publish some um uh you know industry standards that we've been working, you know, you've seen countries come together on this. So I'm I'm actually kind of encouraged about the, the way we're being thoughtful, You're, we're not shutting things down and we're continuing to look for the upside, the opportunity, but but also talking about where we should put up guardrails. But that, that'll be work. You know this better than I do. There's real policy work here. There's real um, inter- multinational um, work to get done to go cross countries. And what about defense? I mean, and, and national security that uh, we, uh, in some sense, these things, of course, once they're unleashed, they're unleashed. And there are good scientists who can, and the models are available probably across almost entirely cross national borders, and maybe one can confine them a little bit. Uh, I just recently there was we were talking in mid July. There was a story about the Chinese penetrating our, uh, I guess, parts of the U.S. government. Uh, uh, I don't know. I just uh, of course one hears these things all the time. I mean, how? And then there's the weapons too, which do seem I don't know. That seems to be maybe to be underreported in terms of what's some of the progress there, but. People I know in defense are a little bit are don't quite know how fast that's going to go. You know, drones and but sort of. I would just give me your general sense of that. I mean, I mean, on the, on the one hand, I think it's been incredibly useful on the defense side 
we talked a little bit about it, but our, you know, our team in at Google in the cybersecurity space, we had a team in 2011 that was starting to figure out where could we use artificial intelligence, machine learning in defending ourselves. And so we've been continuing to do that. And I think there's lots of upside in helping the experts who are defending in the way I just described, right? They're going to be beneficiaries of these tools as well. But you're right, um, whether it's in the cybersecurity landscape or any other sort of interaction between the kinetic and the digital world, uh, we have to anticipate that people will, will try and use these tools. So, um, you know, just like I don't, I don't, I'm an expert on the U Ukraine war, but we've seen, you know, the we've seen the on the digital side, we've seen a very active cybersecurity front, and you've seen a very active drone front. Like again, right. so that's part, been a big part of the news. There's no reason these questions aren't going to be a part of those discussions, and they, sh and they should be. And I think we should get ahead of that. Back to my point of norms and standards and how we work across countries. I think the sooner we're working together as a, um, a sort of governments, like-minded governments and, and industry, I see signs of that. I feel the good news is we're talking about that already, right? It's not, yeah. we're not waiting 12 years for that to emerge. But it does sound, and neither of us is an expert on war and and, and military hardware and, st and things like that, but it does sound like it would be surprising if we didn't, stuff's happening in Ukraine that people did not really had never seen before, I think it's almost safe to say, or and didn't expect 10 years ago, mm -hmm. probably in terms of the drugs. Yes. And, and yeah. it sounds to me like we should also, 10 years from now, if, if unfortunately there might, is another war somewhere, there could be further leaps forward, right? I mean, it's it's sort of, we're not, uh, again, I'm struck just the, without even anticipating massive breakthroughs or real inflection points even, we're just early in this stage of, whatever this revolution we're in is, technological revolution. Or yeah. And there, I don't think there's a domain that's Im immune from those questions because uh, it's a general purpose tool. These are not, these are enabling tools. They are not end games in the, in themselves, right? They're, they're, it's just the start of that question. I, mean, I suppose it's like early in the industrial revolution. It's like, wow, cars, you know, that were trains, I guess, first they replace, you know, horse-drawn carriages and, and, vehicles and and that seemed like a, it was a huge huge thing and transformed the, the countries and war and economies and stuff but it turns out when you step back 100 years later and you think you know well yeah well cars were uh, trains were part of it and then cars and then planes and then a million other things i mean it we're, we're sort of in the car stage not or in the train stage not yet in the car or, or plane stage it sounds like uh, i think that's right kind of a, i do think uh, you're, you're and making it's also the right. going faster right so it's not going to take 100 years this time it's going to take that's right. 20 years. I mean, to my, to my, I think that's what surprised people. And I, and I think what we're figuring out is that how quickly a bit more expertise can change. Like to your point, it, it, just because someone invents a, a different form factor for the combustion engine, it still takes decades for that to find its way into all the machines. In this case, those, those benefits occur in the same day. Yeah. That's, that's kind of amazing. Further, a final things people should think about in, in this area or that we haven't quite covered uh, uh, enough? No, I think just, I would just come back to that sort of the, this, this balance between being bold and trying to really make this useful. This is sort of, I think, one of our strengths as an open and uh, society in that sense. And at the same time, being responsible and figuring out the right ways um, to do it. And I think that's, you know, there's enthusiasm on both sides of that. And they will, the, the, the reality will get worked out in the middle, and I think that's good. I think being sort of both is where we've we've you know been successful as a society, and I, I think it, to the degree we can keep that lens on it, the better off we'll be. Well, that's a good a good point, a good thing to end on. But I think things things are changing fast enough that we'll have to have this conversation again. And uh, looking forward to it. Eighteen months, maybe even faster. But I, I, this has been very helpful to me in sort of clarifying where we've been and and where we are, and and somewhat on the one hand. I think uh, non-alarmist in the sense of, you know, we're not looking at computers running the world in two or three years. But on the other hand, I think, you know, being sober about the the speed with which change is, has come and is now coming. And I think that's your, it is continuing to come. We're not, this isn't, we haven't seen, oh my God, that was a huge breakthrough over the last five years. Now we're going to plateau for 10 Wait years. For that is next. not going to happen. No, you're going to notice it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, on that note, Royal, thanks so much for taking the time today. Uh, to join me, really instructive discussion. Thanks for having me. Look forward to the next one. Yeah, me too. And thank you all for joining us on Conversations.